And he came up with a very useful, almost an algebraic equation. He indicated that the perception of risk, how people perceive risk, equals the sum of the actual scientific level risk, if you will, plus this more nebulous emotional affective component, which he calls dread or outrage. Kim Skorupski again from Hopkins, and I'm here with the newbie, Dr. Dan Barnett. Dan, how are you? I'm very well, Kim. How are you? I'm so good, and I'm so appreciative that you are here on the Faculty Factory podcast. Dr. Barnett arrived here by introduction from George Everly. Dr. Everly's been on the podcast a couple times, and this is a great example of friends and podcast people referring us to other great podcast guests. So Dan and I have been talking before I press record here, and he has a super cool background. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Dr. Barnett. Who are you and what do you do here at Hopkins? Well, great. Thanks, Kim, for the opportunity to be on this podcast. I'm very excited about it, and I appreciate George's uh, recommending me for participation on it. My name is Dan Barnett. I'm an associate professor uh, at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, My primary uh, appointment is in Department of Environmental Health and Engineering, and I have joint appointments in Health Policy and Management and Health Behavior and Society Departments at the school. Uh, By way of background, I am a physician trained in general preventive medicine. Uh, That's what brought me to Hopkins gosh, almost 20 years ago. It's hard to believe. And uh, my research uh, focuses on public health, emergency preparedness and response. Uh, And uh, these have been very uh, interesting times, we'll put it that way, given uh, the challenges that uh, public health and healthcare systems face with regard to COVID-19. Talk about preparedness for global pandemic preparedness. This is just kind of like you were meant to be doing this at the right time (laughs) in the right place. So Gosh, I think I, I like this. You're, you have the NIH Fogarty uh, Project Award and you do you have things we talked about, willingness to respond, your first paper that you published with George Everly and healthcare workforce issues. What, uh, let's get into some, some wisdom that you can impart to the Faculty Factory podcast listeners that, that kind of undergird the work you've done, all the self-efficacy work and all that that kind of stuff. Can you weave this together for me? Because as I mentioned before, you were talking about so many cool things you're doing and the amazing relevance and perfect timing of this. And from faculty perspectives, you know, there's just so much going on. It's we're really overloaded with things. And some, so many of us feel helpless and anxious and this heightened level of you know, post-traumatic stress almost and wondering just total fatigue. You know, what what have you learned through your work and your study about not only preparing, but then, you know, being resilient and coming through the darkness? Oh, great question, Kim. Thank you for uh, sort of the chance to expand upon this. Um, So uh, to sort of Put it in a nutshell, uh, what I have been researching on for many years, along with George Everly and other colleagues, is not the ability of people to uh, do their jobs. For example, a pathologist knowing how to look at um, uh, a microbe under the microscope, but rather willingness to come into work in high dread environments of healthcare and public health personnel. And one of the things that we found, my colleagues and I, uh, uh, from our research over many years, is that willingness to respond is not the same as ability to respond. So going back to the pathologist, my father's a pathologist, so I'm going to use that as an example. Not that this is not that my father's been part of these studies. I don't mean it that way, obviously. But um, uh, someone's ability to look at anthrax under a microscope is not the same as one's willingness to come to work to look at anthrax under a microscope. And there's been a longstanding assumption that uh, in the world of preparedness training, that if we train people how to do something in a high dread environment, then automatically they'll be comfortable, confident, and willing to uh, perform those roles. And our research um, in healthcare personnel Uh, among healthcare personnel, public health personnel. We've also even looked at medical reserve corps volunteers in terms of willingness to volunteer, uh, has really shown that 
that it's an incorrect assumption to to um, postulate that ability maps onto willingness. They're two different things. So um, we need to train not just uh, how to do things for healthcare and public health workers, but give them the confidence uh, and uh, sort of toolkit to feel that they have self-efficacy to do so. So we can actually train toward boosting willingness to respond. And much of our research has, has not just look, looked at gaps in willingness to respond, but identifying evidence-based uh, curricula and other approaches that have we found in, in our studies to, that have boosted willingness to respond in high dread context scenarios. Two things you said that were really, um, that I wanted to kind of pause for a second and, and amplify this. Sure. The first time you said high dread environment, I mm-hmm. thought you said hybrid, H Y B R E. Oh. <laughs> and I thought this is how interesting. But the lesson there was when the things we hear can really change our perspective of things. So hybrid and high dread. I've never heard this um, phrase high dread environment, and right. it so perfectly captures what's happening with and been happening with the the pandemic. But even before that. There's a whole, I'm sure, the literature, which is fascinating, which is why it's great to talk to people in interdisciplinary um, fields that, yeah, you can see how this would really lead into motivation or lack thereof motivation. So high dread environment. I'm curious to hear more about where this term, or maybe you coined it, arrived. And the second thing, what does, when you're talking about ability to respond versus willingness to respond, can you just put a give a little bit more insight into the willingness to respond? Because to me, that seems like if someone wants to train to do something, to do a procedure, doesn't it imply a willingness? And then where, if not, where does the willingness fall apart? Where does I want to be a nurse? And so I'm trained to be a nurse. And now I have the ability, I have the knowledge, attitude, skills. I am practicing. I'm the behavior. Now I'm a nurse. And now all of a sudden, my willingness to be a nurse has gone away. Like, where does that happen and why does that happen? So I know two big questions, but back up to the high dread environment, super cool terminology. Where'd that come from? Yes. Uh, well, both great questions, Kim. So um, the, the term dread comes from uh, research on risk communication uh, that I, I did not coin. I give full attribution, but uh, the, the uh, individual or one of the individuals who's uh, come up with the term dread. His name is Peter Sandman, S-A-N-D-M-A-N. And he came up with a very useful, almost an algebraic equation <laughs> where he said, the per- he indicated that the perception of risk, how people perceive risk, equals the sum of the actual scientific level risk, if you will, plus this more nebulous emotional affective component, which he calls dread or outrage. Ooh. And so, uh, you know, any time in the day is uh, too early or late to do algebra. But if you were to try to to um, use that equation to our advantage, uh, we want to, through risk communication, to align the perception of risk with the actual scientific risk. And with using that equation, we want to minim- minimize or ideally eliminate, easier said than done, the outrage or dread component. So there's a that's the affective component is the dread. Mm-hmm. And dread affects people's um, uh, sense of, of perspectives toward their work, toward all sorts of behaviors. Uh, and so that's the um, long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, I love, love, love it. I love algebra. I love equation. <laughs> so right away, I'm like, why is a function of X? So the, let's get stick with that. But super, right. super interesting. And I'm not going to belabor it. People are thinking, yes, please, Kim, shut up. Um, uh, because this is such, I can see how it leads into burnout and, oh, what's this other term that our nursing uh, friends use? Oh, Cinda Rushton talks about this moral injury, uh, these really interesting concepts of how we arrive in the workplace and how the workplace environment just um, impacts positively or negatively how we how we do our job. So I just think it's super cool. So I'll stop there. But yeah, let's go into that willingness to where does the willingness go? When does it when does it um, go? Right. 
Great, great. Uh, all your questions are great. That's why you do this. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Um, so uh, there are uh, sort of a way to unpack willingness uh, is thinking of three different domains, which I'll briefly walk through. So uh, several years ago, uh, my colleagues and I published a concept paper that's based on the commonly used catchphrase, readiness, willingness, and ability. And this is this paper was, uh, we published it in a, in a peer-reviewed journal, and it was all in the framework of applying these common, this common catchphrase, ready, willing, and able, to what those each mean in, in what we're talking about now. So if I could maybe just describe each quickly, and, and, and you'll hopefully it'll be clear what, where willingness fits in. So let's start with um, readiness. Readiness, uh, based on our adapted definition in the context of emergencies and disasters is, do you have plans in place at your hospital? Not only do you have plans in place for a response, but do people know what those plans are? Otherwise, it's like a tree falling in the forest, obviously. Um, do you have um, personal and family preparedness kits? So even at the household level, that's a part of readiness. Um, are, does the uh, facility provide people or, or supplement what are called go kits, which basically if you're uh, having to do long stretches at work, do you have these kits available to you? Um, and, um, you know, and that's, that's sort of the readiness component. It's, uh, it's the planning, it's the um, infrastructure surrounding uh, one, oneself in response. Then let's go a little out of order because the, the phrase is typically ready, willing, and able, but I'll do ready, able, and willing. So ability or able in this context means skills and knowledge. And for the longest time, that has been the focus of emergency preparedness training. So from a clinical standpoint, um, how to recognize signs and symptoms of uh, a particular category A bioterrorism agent, which by the way, all look like the flu initially. So that's a whole other challenge, but let's just use that as an example. Once, once the prodromal phase ends, what are the signs and symptoms? How can we distinguish tularemia from smallpox and so forth? So recognizing signs and symptoms, that's ability. But the willingness part is, the, is a set of uh, attitudes and perceptions separate from ability. So um, I can be able to recognize signs and symptoms of anthrax or tularemia or botulism. Uh, but that may not be mean that I'm willing to come to work to apply that knowledge and skill mm -hmm. because of the dread that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of barriers that we found um, that uh, we can talk about, uh, if you'd like, that relate to um, enhanced willingness or lower levels of willingness. Really interesting finding, I think, from our work is that willingness to respond is scenario specific, even within an individual. So my willingness to come to work in a radiological uh, dirty bomb event, a dirty bomb is essentially TNT mixed with radionuclides. So when the explosion happens, there's a release of radiation. It's much more of a psychological threat, by the way, a dirty bomb than a physical one, because the amount of radiation released is relatively low. But the dread that we talked about, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of research about what's called radiophobia, is extraordinarily high. So the dread is high. So in other words, I might know all of the clinical syndromes. Um, related to, um, you know, acute radiation syndrome. But does that mean that I'm willing to come to work to take care of patients who've been um, affected by such an event? Mm. And those are, and our, our research really points to those being two separate con concepts that, um, frankly, it's a, it's a, not only a mistaken assumption to assume they're the same ability and willingness, they're not only not the same, but it's actually dangerous to assume they're the same. Because if we assume that by training someone on knowledge and skills, that that's automatically going to translate into willingness, uh, our research uh, consistently points to that not being the case. Wow. So blowing my mind. So first of all, so again, I have two comments and I'm going to talk really fast to get them out of, out of the way because I want to learn from you. The first is, is that willingness component, is that what we're seeing when we have people who are trained, I'm going to stick with the nursing example, in a field, and it could be anything, 
and they get the degree, the certification, then they go get the job and then they go, Ugh, this isn't at all what I thought this was going to be. I thought I was going to be spending my time doing A and who knew that doing nursing involved a lot of doing X. Mm-hmm. I'm not willing to do this part of the job or the, the drudgery part of the job. And so then they, I don't want to say burn out because they're barely in the job for a minute. I'm thinking of even family members and neighbors or who have gone through all the certification training programs. And then they, my, my little cousin back 30 years ago, she went to be a, a hotel desk, front desk person, hospitality person. And mm-hmm. she did this program and then got there and she's like, well, this is dumb. I'm just standing in this hotel lobby and there's nobody here. And this is not anywhere how she had romanticized or perceived this position was going to be something that it was not. And so I'm wondering if that's what an example of willingness and I'll pause there, because, but I wanted to bring a second story in. Am I a little bit off on that or is that? No, that's, that's spot on Kim. And um, actually researchers, uh, my, my colleagues and, and, and I, as well as other research, have found gaps in willingness to respond among not just physicians, um, not just clerical and support staff, but also nurses. And as since you mentioned nurses, as, as, as you're obviously well aware, and I'm sure our audience is, that nurses by far and away comprise the largest component of healthcare workers. So any deficits in willingness that relate to reluctance to either perform role uh, uh, specific activities in a disaster by nurses or any other kind of provider is a real surge capacity, what we call surge capacity threat, meaning um, the ability of hospitals and healthcare systems to ramp up to um, deal with a surge of patients. We're seeing um, a lot of high level of vulnerability right now with Omicron because and, and world, uh, director of the World Health Organization has described these considerations in terms of there, it doesn't take much for there to be a tipping point for overwhelming healthcare systems, that's, as you're well aware. Yeah, that's right. And it's, I'm thinking in my neighborhood, we have so many nurses now who their the cars in the parking lot are gone all the time because they're having to cover so many extra shifts and taking on all that time. And so here's a story that I can't get out of my head now that when you're talking about dread and outrage being personalized is that in my personal story. I know a man who has been a firefighter for almost 40, four zero years. Wow. And when COVID struck initially, so first responder, firefighter, this is a man who his entire life has run into burning buildings right. and saved countless lives, been mm-hmm. on fire, all this stuff. When COVID hit, he had a, a breakdown. He yes. had to be, he had to see a professional. He had to go on anti-anxiety medications. He had to take a leave of absence and get a desk job. He, his body absorbed this um, concern and worry. He developed sciatica. And mm-hmm. when I talked to him, he said, Kim, it's, it's an invisible threat. He said, I can go, I see the fire. I know how to put that fire out. This bug, this virus, this, he said, I don't know what to do with this. We're going into rescue people and I've got to have all my people totally, you know, geared up and masked up and all every time we go to a patient who's having a heart attack or any kind of event or a car accident or a fire. He said, it just, I don't, I'm so worried for my men and women, um, I, I, I can't, because I can't see, it's an invisible enemy, it's an invisible threat. And that dread just completely changed his willingness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I almost don't want to say willingness because he wanted to do the job. He just couldn't. He really, uh, it was a block. He couldn't bring himself and it manifested in his body. He, he literally, to this day, I think, almost two years into this is um, in a desk job. He just simply, he couldn't do it. And it was just stunning to me to see these heroic people who can be really laid out flat by some new dread. Absolutely. And um, so it's a really unfortunate scenario, but 
uh, also, unfortunately, it's not uncommon with what we're seeing even now uh, with COVID and Omicron at the time of our recording of this. And um, a couple of, of relevant thoughts um, uh, to that. You had mentioned in the, very aptly that the, the firefighter um, was particularly frightened because this is something he could not see. And there's a researcher named uh, Paul Slovich uh, from University of Oregon, and he's uh, um, uh, also affiliated with, with other, um, another institute. But um, he published a paper in the 1980s, a seminal paper uh, uh, regarding what he calls axes of risk perception. And there are the key findings from that is one of the elements that makes risk higher dread for people is if it's not visible. Much like to use a more um, sort of uh, uh, popular culture theme, when you're watching a, a frightening movie, what you don't see around the corner and the term psychological thriller, we hear that all the time, is more frightening in many cases than what you can see in a, in a, in a, in a horror movie, for example. Right. And so, and so uh, the, the research by Paul Slovich, was, which is really um, critical for underpinning all of, all, uh, so much of subsequent research uh, on risk perception, basically speaks to what this anecdote that you described um, um, alludes to. So the fact that this firefighter cannot see the threat makes the threat higher dread to the firefighter or to anybody else. Radiation, by the way, is the same way. Uh, you can't see, smell, taste, or touch radiation. So um, if it were visible, according to this, at these axes of risk perception from, from Paul Slovich, then um, it would be um, much more uh, acceptable in some ways to people. So that's a really interesting finding uh, from research that dates back almost 40 years from, uh, from this line of research. And it also speaks to why um, the unseen virus, which by definition is unseen, is, is a high dread circumstance. So it all ties in together. And, and just one side note I wanna mention, you know, you, you very aptly mentioned about, you know, this is an individual who runs into, into burning buildings. When we talk about willingness to respond, this, isn't, this is not intended as a pejorative kind of assessment. These, these are human reactions that people understandably have where they're making risk assessments, even for their own jobs. In other words, you know, we talked about nurses. Uh, hypothetically, one could say, I didn't sign up for this, or I'm not getting paid enough for this. Right. Yeah, now that that is, I'm so glad you've segued and pivoted to this angle, because at some point, God willing, we will be out of this pandemic and um, the virus we put aside, and yet we will still be in academic medicine, where... Our salaries are lower than in private practice, where we are under-resourced, where we are um, challenged to discover and treat and cure and prevent and publish and get grant funding and teach and start programs and serve on committees and, 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 and oh, by the way, maybe have a life and have a family and right. engage in hobbies and passions. So all that will still be there. So I love how now you're talking about this, the fact that willingness is not something that it's not a, a scarlet letter. That not at you're all. just not being a team player and you just no. need to buck up and come on, man, suck it up. You know, exactly. what's wrong with you? That's exactly right. And so that's the context in which this we, we examine this question in which we uh, propose or develop evidence-based approaches to boosting willingness to respond. Uh, as a side note, the leading modifier of willingness to respond that we found is based on uh, Bandura's concept of self-efficacy. Um, and um, one of the uh, sort of keys to the kingdom, if you will, to boost self-efficacy through our research is, uh, or to boost willingness to respond is self-efficacy focused training. Mm. In other words, um, giving public health and healthcare workers and other parts of the public health uh, and healthcare response system, those workforce members, uh, a sense that they can function effectively in sometimes uncertain and unpredictable environments. Very importantly, there's research uh, uh, 
from Columbia University that has highlighted that um, if, if, for example, in, an, uh, in a pandemic influenza event, uh, based on this is pre-COVID-19 research, that if a hospital provides priority access uh, to vaccines and antivirals, for example, to their workers, then those workers will be more comfortable and confident to come into work. So it's almost this, um, like a fiduciary kind of commitment in a way. Uh, we're expecting you to do, you know, high risk work. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to do to, on our end as at, at the administrative level, for example, mm -hmm. to uh, ensure that you're optimally protected in doing so. Well, that makes a lot of sense because I was going to ask you, what are some of these evidence-based evidence interventions? And you're saying one is giving priority access to tools or resources. And I'm wondering if there's a corollary, like I'm imagining this bell curve where, for example, the literature shows that at a certain salary level, people don't have um, greater job fulfillment or greater commitment to the agency after you make over pretend it's a hundred thousand dollars. And I don't know what the literature says so that you can keep giving people bonuses and money and it's not going to necessarily keep them there. It's something more than that. And I'm wondering if similarly, what you're finding for evidence-based interventions to increase willingness, that priority access to me shows a commitment to me. Is there also a downside to once you you give me so many tchotchkes, if I, you give me another water bottle, I have enough water bottles. Mm -hmm. I don't need any more flash right. drives. Like what um, what other things are you discovering increased willingness? And then is there a downside or is there a, a moment, whatever that would be called in the curve where it's like you it's not meaningful anymore? Do you know, I don't know what to say, but yeah, I'm, no, that's that's that. Again, I'm thinking you got me thinking about math and the equation. Oh, no, that's a great question. Yeah, it goes back to the algebra comment earlier right. I made. Um, uh, really very apt question. Um, so what the literature seems to propose or, or, or to suggest is that tangible sort of protective interventions and giving priority access to those, such as vaccines and antivirals, or whatever other, in the case of, Om of Omicron or, or, or whatever new variants of COVID uh, uh, emerge. And again, this is based on prior research, not COVID-based research, but you know, the idea is still applicable, but more research is needed as they say. Uh, but giving priority access to vaccines and antivirals is really what it's about uh, uh, to, to really um, get a sense of whether, as you, I like the word tchotchkes, whether that makes a difference. That really has not been studied. Uh, I, it, there is uh, um, some sort of um, uh, in, in, uh, idea that uh, it's important for leadership to uh, um, recognize and praise and show appreciation to their workers who are putting their lives um, in harm's way. Mm -hmm. uh, and a little goes a long way in that regard. Uh, so in prior uh, studies, we did focus groups where even uh, where we interviewed um, public health workers uh, in various parts of the, of the U.S. regarding willingness to respond to a variety of scenarios. And one of the themes is that even a note from the, the leadership of thanks makes a huge difference. It's amazing, you know, the, how, how seemingly very, a very modest kind of expression like that can go such a long way. Um, obviously, that's not uh, in and of itself sufficient, but it's very important. Right. So uh, we've heard expressions like healthcare heroes. And I think that I, I love that because uh, I think we, we really need to redefine in many ways what we call essential employees. This is just a, a side note, but I, you know, for many years, um, you know, I, I, we live in Baltimore. And in Baltimore, um, you know, we call it a winter blast. And that's a uh, maybe a half a centimeter of snow two days from now, right? <laughs> so, and I'm not, that's not being pejorative to Baltimore. It's a very, you know, but, but I love Baltimore. But um, the idea that, um, you, that what we call, you'll often previously have seen the term essential employees need to report. Right. Well, one of the things we've learned in this pandemic is that the definition of essential employees has brought into 
food service workers, to all sorts of occupational cohorts that used to not be within that sort of umbrella of essential workers. So I think we need to, uh, through this research on willingness to respond, one of the take homes is that these kinds of events are all hands on deck. Everyone from clerical and support staff, who by the way, are also the front lines of crisis risk communication when they answer the phones, Mm -hmm. all the way to the CEO of a hospital or healthcare system, everyone plays a role. So that's, um, again, a long uh, answer to a, a comment, but I, I think it's really important uh, that, that we address that. Just very p- briefly, another kind of efficacy that we found is very important. It has nothing to do with the term, the, the disaster psych- life cycle. It's called response efficacy. And one of the things we found in our research as a positive modifier of willingness to respond among healthcare personnel and public health personnel is the sense that if one perceives that he or she, or or they matter, or they matter Mm. in the response, they are much more likely to be willing to respond than if they perceive that their role is unimportant. Ah. So that's a take home for training because we need to not just train us to, to knowledge and skills. We've already discussed that during the podcast so far, but we also need to train to the efficacy piece both self-efficacy, the sense of confidence that you can perform your role with agility in uncertain environments, and the sense that you matter, huh. that you make a difference at the individual level. Yes. There's a th- this notion of, we've heard the psychological concept of diffusion of responsibility. If you work in a very large medical center, for example, with thousands of employees, oh, maybe someone won't notice me if I'm not there. One of the other 15,000 people will take my place. But these kinds of events, as we're seeing in real time at this time of this podcast uh, with Omicron, um, reflect the all hands on deck nature of this. And that includes both self-efficacy for training and response efficacy for training to boost response willingness. And Dan Barnett, I am loving this because what this all tells me, again, is it's so important that this lesson is enduring because... You mentioned earlier, the first thing in the readiness is, is there a plan in place and do people know the plan? To me, guess what? Yes, this um, pandemic will end and there will be another, who knows how long, but wow, for people to feel like they value, that they have value and they have meaning and they are um, important and they have purpose, this starts way before any kind of pandemic. Absolutely. The things we do in the interim are are those steps of making people feel like they matter. It starts before the the emergency. Oh my gosh! Now it's all hands on deck, and then then the person is like, "Oh, now I'm important. Oh, now right. you need me. Now you're going to give me a water bottle." But at, at the prior ten years, you're not developing me. You're not giving me the resources or tools to do mm-hmm. my job. Oh, and on top of all that, you're paying me at and on the 20% of the going rate at the salary levels across North America. So I think to me, a, a, a lesson here that you're talking about, Dan, is that we have to, to stretch that this preparedness, this planning happens obviously in non-emergencies. Right. And, and, and you take this concept of emergency preparedness to just out of its out of its um field of emergencies and just say, how about preparedness? Stop, hard stop. Right. Meaning prepare, prepare your employees to always be willing. Why? Because they matter, they're important, and we give them the tools. We want them to come and do the best job ever at this institution. Well, we're going to give them the best tools and resources and programs and policies ever because that is elevating. So to me, that congruence will then ensure or have a higher probability of ensuring willingness when, yeah, in good times and in bad. And when things are are um, steady, we're still treated like we are important and, we, and they, we're worthy of the best of everything. Just like you said earlier, that priority access, even in the non-emergencies, we're given priority access to all the best tools to do the best jobs that we can. That's exactly right. There's a term in the in the field. It's a bit of a, a colloquial term, but we call those blue sky days, where we think about planning, not and, and response, not in the midst of an event, but before an event. 
or after an event, but when, when things have calmed. And, and to your excellent point, Kim, that's exactly the time to reinforce and establish the importance of every single employee. So uh, to your point, people don't say, oh, now you need me. Mm-hmm. 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 Exactly right. I love that blue sky days, right? This is another, we always seem to need these lessons, another reminder that we will be more willing to respond and willing to show up in crises and in regular blue sky days when we feel like we matter. Exactly. When we are missed, if we're not there, it's uh, the old, the, the, che- the, the sitcom cheers when you walk in the door, when you, when you throw open that front door and kick, kick open that back door, even right. slink, slink in the front door, slink in the back door, are people going to say, Dan, exactly. uh, we've missed you. Where have you been? We need you. I need you. That mm-hmm. to me will say, I'm willing to go to battle for anybody when I, as you mentioned earlier, I have even just the simplest efforts of gratitude and acknowledging my existence. So, gosh, so many great lessons. What else? I, I don't want to keep talking to you, but I don't want to. I know we're supposed to keep the podcast short. My producer, Casey Callanan, says, but I just love talking to you. What else? Well, thank let's you. Go for, let's go for a little more because you are so super smart and I'm enjoying this. What else? I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity again. Um, so one of the interesting things to your point uh, that we found in research looking at um, health departments. So uh, between 2008 and 2013, approximately, we did uh, a, a very large study of um, over 70 U.S. health departments across nine states looking at willingness to respond. And that's where a lot of these insights came from. Um, uh, and one of the things that we found is that willingness to respond was higher in rural health departments than in urban health departments. And when we did focus groups on that, because we were curious about that, because we did, we did, this was mixed methods research. We did a survey and then we did a focus group to understand more nuanced insights from the survey. We heard things that really intrigued us. Uh, people in rural communities and some of these communities we're talking 2,000 people, maybe, or, or around that ballpark. The, feed, or the feedback or the comments from the focus groups among these rural health department employees were things like, well, I, I work in a 10-person health department. If I don't show up, A, I will be noticed. Oh. <laughs> B, I will be missed. And if I'm at the, uh, doing something out and about, my neighbors know who I am yeah. and where I work. And they're going to wonder, well, why aren't you at work? Yeah. So, you know, the, this kind of small town life sociology uh, research dates back mm-hmm. decades and decades. So this is not new. But what it does suggest is that we need to create that same kind of sense of purpose, mission, and, and, and sense of need of one's role in large institutions as we, and in large uh, jurisdictions as we have in small jurisdictions. Mm. Where you, it's easier to hide. In other words, I hate to sound cynical, and that's not the intent. But uh, for lack of a better phrase, it's easier to hide when you're in a very large institution, right? Than when you're uh, just the math. Going, not I won't do algebra anymore. But go, doing <laughs> doing the math. If you're in, and there are health departments that have five people of in the course. United States. And if, and if I don't show up, who who's going to exactly. do that? Not only, that's I mean, good. that jo- work will not get done. That's exactly right. And, and, and to that point, one of the uh, evidence-based curricular activities that we've done that we've found can boost willingness to respond is we do, it's called a contingency scenario planning exercise, which sounds like a mouthful, but it's very, it's much simpler than that. Imagine um, a dartboard, you have concentric circles mm-hmm. and at the, the center of uh, the, the innermost circle is self. The next outermost is family. Mm-hmm. The third outermost is agency or, or institution and the outermost the last uh, uh, circumferential one is community mm. so what we do what we've done through our, our, our research-based trainings is we've conducted an exercise where we ask employees to consider what is the, what are the benefits to oneself one's family and one's uh, respectively uh, and one's agency and one's community respectively if they show up to work and so there's that sort of ripple effect if right. you will and and the aha moments that we've received, although you know that's not we don't use words like aha moments in peer-reviewed research, but I can tell you anecdotally, the aha moments have been profound because a lot of times understanding 
how one's coming to work has positive ripple effects on one's own, yeah. oneself, one's family, one's agency, and one's community can be a real light bulb for people's sense of that term we talked about earlier, response efficacy. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. I'm loving, loving, loving this. So you're right. So I'm thinking of the, when COVID hit and we talked about the ripple effects of, this is not just employees in the building. This is, if we're not going into the building, this is the security guards who let us into the building. This is impacting the housekeeping who worked in the building. This is impacting the guys who have the food carts on the corner on Monument Street and the nearby restaurants and the parking lots, all those ripple effects that everybody, everybody in the world saw with our restaurants and our shopping and groceries and all those ripple effects. I think what a great idea to to demonstrate or prove to people like let's take this in the employee employment sector is this ripple effect of the your your dartboard metaphor of self family agency or institution and community i think maybe a lot of times that could be another gratitude is showing or the pro- proving to people like you you know we hope we're helping you see that you matter. And if you don't, let me, let's go through the chain of command, if you will, not going up, but going out and showing that if you, this, it's the, if then loops. And, Mm -hmm. and I'm, I can't help but thinking of Peter Pronovost from the Armstrong Institute, you know, the guy who talked about, you know, the checklist, the quality is he gave a story when he would give talks about, gosh, who was it? Uh, some general or some military guy who said the most important person in the hospital, or maybe it's Peter said the most important person in the hospital is the person who cleans the restrooms. And the most important person on the aircraft carrier was the guy who, I don't know, hooks up the, the planes to the whatever. The, the people that maybe we tend to say, well, in a pecking order, they don't matter. Or these worker bees don't matter. But if you pause a moment and we help each other, and others, and as leaders, look at that, take a pause, and then look at that ripple effect, literally like chart it out. If this doesn't happen, here are how this, you know, seven, eight, 10, 12 degrees of separation, then you realize I matter. Oh my gosh, I do matter. I will train, change the time vortex. Um, I'm watching some, I'm watching Loki on Disney Plus, and Loki's always <laughs> jumping time. We can change things for the good or the bad. So, um, all right, I'll st- shut up there because now I'm getting all excited. <laughs> no, no, it's, a, it's very, it is very exciting. It's a, and it, I think it really relates to um, organizational culture considerations. So um, going back to the all hands on deck, uh, everyone has an important role to play. One of the um, things we've learned from our research on uh, boosting willingness to respond through, through training is to have... Um, people do a crosswalk exercise where they on one column list their day-to-day activities and on the other column, how those day-to-day activities and skill sets would apply in a public health or emergency or disaster. And that does two things. It, one, it gives them a sense of confidence that goes back to self-efficacy. So one of the things that we often, in my, in my experience with training and, and research, um, have, have seen is, well, there may be concern uh, if someone is uh, thinks that they're going to be asked to vaccinate someone if they've never used a needle before in their in their work, and so part of it is understanding that and reassuring people that we're not going to ask people to do something that's beyond their skill set. It, it may be adapted or extended from their existing skill set, but it's not. We're not asking someone in, for example, fiscal, which is a critical role, to to vaccinate people. Right. Now, when they say, "Well, that's a ridiculous assumption," why would someone assume that? Well. You know, these are um, uh, sort of uh, tightrope kinds of situations uh, in disasters, and people may not understand sort of that there is a s- scope to which they will not be asked to do something that's beyond their daily skill set. Scope, uh, that is such a great word, Dan, scope. And that that when I can go into an environment, even if it's a high dread environment, and I trust, and I have that level of trust and confidence in my leadership and in my team that they got me and that I'm properly scoped and that you're right. I'm not going to be plucked from the chorus Mm -hmm. and thrown up 
at the front of the stage with a microphone to do a solo. It's not going to happen. And in the worst case scenario, even if it were like, no, Dan, you're the only one who can fly this plane. We know you've done some virtual reality stuff. Uh, get in there. And you're like, I'm not trained for this, but we're going to help you. And we're going to be right there with you. That I think is what makes the difference um, in showing up at work. And so anyway. That's exactly right. Another interesting uh, aspect, uh, just piggybacking on that, we found in our hospital-based research is that a positive modifier willingness to respond is whether one perceives that their coworkers will be likely to come into work. Wow. So there's a sort of a social normative component. Right. If, in other words, if one is uncertain that their colleagues will be apt to come into work, we found that uh, that individual would be less likely to be definitively willing to come into work. So it's an organizational cultural component. Right, exactly. And that cor- that organizational cultural thing, Dan, also parlays into the competence and the trust that the people who work with me are equally skilled and trained and have the knowledge and have all those behaviors and have um, the passion and the that they embody the same um, whatever, all the same traits that I have. And so, and that can, I think, only be nurtured if, again, through leadership and the institution, you know, purposely invests in and properly scopes out the work and in, invests in the training and the retention and all those things that bring people into the family, you know, the, the institution or the agency. And then have that practice the gratitude to grow and develop the employees and the faculty and the staff so that, yeah, in moments of hardship, you you just know, I'm thinking almost like in, in the military too, you know that in that foxhole, everybody's been trained, you know, they all know what their uh, what mm-hmm. the job is, what their role is, and you can cross train and you cover each other and you love each other mm-hmm. and, and you're in it uh, together, right? That's right. One of the interesting uh, things that, that we've uh, used in a very tangible way are something called job action sheets. So job, a job action sheet is, uh, uh, for those in our audience who may not know, is, is basically a list of one's roles and responsibilities. Yeah. And, and in, in one of our trainings uh, activities, we do a crosswalk between one's day-to-day job action sheets right. and one's how that would translate in the other column to a disaster context job action sheet. Again, to your point that we're not asking someone from fiscal to vaccinate someone if that's not something they do on a blue sky day. So that's just the the synthesis comment that I... Well, well, I'll close with this one example is, you know, here at Hopkins, we get these emails saying, you know, when the hospital's in a little bit of a a pickle. And so we could look before they do mandatory reassignment of job roles, they're asking for people to, to do and volunteer in different functions. And one of the things that caught my eye was deliver food trays, transport, and run, be a runner. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but I'm like, I'm in. So I signed up, I clicked the thing, I got another link and thank you for volunteering, you know, go to this portal, sign up for here. And so I did it and I'm clicking, I'm doing all these things and all these modules showed up and it was all about epic training Mm-hmm. And this woman had a voiceover and she's clicking about, you know, 150 things. And I'm trying to watch what in the world is going on. Why do I need to do all this to deliver a food tray or to push sure. a wheelchair around? And then I replied to the woman who'd sent me the link. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, I don't mean to be ignorant, but I, I'm not getting that link. It doesn't open up. And she said, oh, no, I'm sorry. You don't have an Epic account. I didn't realize that you're not a clinician or you're not in the healthcare. I'm like, well, no, I'm, I'm an admin. I'm an administration. Sure. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, uh, I had no idea. But that kind of sent me in, into a panic. I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing epic training here. I'm, not. <laughs> sure. And I started having that panic of like, oh, right. this is not good. I'm going to cause a lot of problems if they're going to count on me to, right. go to volunteer. And I got to do all this processing patients. And so that was just a funny for me, a funny, I shouldn't say funny, but, a, but an example of, whoo, I am out of my league. <laughs> this is not, I needed a job, job action sheet because this was not, I, I, I'm thinking, give me a food tray and tell me what room I can do that. <laughs> right. And, and by the way, to that point, cross training to different roles, as long as they're within your yeah. skill set is, is one of the uh, approaches that can be used to sort of enhance surge capacity. 
Dan, I have just loved talking with you, and I'm sure the audience loved learning from you, less much, less so me. But um, if you want to get in touch with Dr. Dan Barnett, MD, MPH, he's an associate professor here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Environmental Health and Engineering, you can email Dan at dbarnett, D B A R N E T 4. Right, Dan? That's right. Just one T. A-A-Q.E-D-U. <laughs> Only one T. They messed you up there. D-B-A-R-N-E-T-4 at J-H-U dot E-D-U. You will find his profile and little synthesis on facultyfactory.org. I hope you've enjoyed uh, Dr. Barnett as much as I have. And tell your friends about the podcast. And geez, you can volunteer to be on the podcast. I'm sure you have lots to share. So, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, You've been wonderful. I've learned so much from you. Thank you for all you do here at Hopkins. And um, gosh, keep it up and and come back on the podcast. I can talk to you and learn from you a a lot more. So thank you so much, Dan. I'll be delighted to. Thank you so much, Kim. I enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.